Hey techies, on Tech Society TV today, we have Jeffrey Drake Brockman. Jeffrey is a cybernetics artist that specializes in large scale public installations with a difference. Incorporating technology such as robotics and lasers to provide unique user experiences that delight audiences. Notable works include Florabots, exhibited at the National Gallery of Australia, and Totem, a 10.5 meter tall installation outside Perth Arena. All this and more coming up, so let's get to it. Okay. Welcome to the first episode of TechSociety.tv. Today we are with Jeffrey Drake Brockman, um, who is a cybernetic artist. That's, yeah. That's the idea, yeah. All right. Jump straight into it then. Yeah, so tell us, what is a cybernetic artist? I had a, uh, a phone call uh, a couple of years ago from somebody called uh, Eben Hall, uh, and he said, I'm calling from uh, the New York office of CNN, and we want to make uh, a short video about your work. And I said, oh, great. And he said, we'll publish it on something called Great Big Story. And I said, yes, very good, very good. And, and they have a standard format, and you have to answer the question, what are you? So I thought, <laughs> what am I? And I thought, am I a robotics artist? And I thought, well, not completely, because I make things which aren't really robotic. Um, am I a sculptor? Yes, but does that properly explain what I do? And after a lot of thought, I decided cybernetics captured the things that interest me. Mm -hmm. uh, cybernetics, you know, strictly in its original formulation by Norbert Wiener is about feedback and it's feedback between systems that interests me. It's possible to make things using uh, digital computation without any feedback being involved. Mm -hmm. But that is not, uh, it, it doesn't uh, build to unexpected outcomes. It's only when you fold the uh, output back into the beginning of the calculation that the, uh, the algorithm can run away and do uh, interesting and unusual things. Mm. So cybernetics kind of uh, encompasses this idea. And so that's what I decided to call myself in my little video, uh, a cybernetics artist. Okay, I, I, I love it. So you came up with the yeah. term cybernetics artist, but is there a, a community of other cybernetics Obviously, yeah, artists? Are you the only cybernetics Are you the only artist? one that you're aware of? There is a history uh, to cybernetics art. But a lot of it was uh, historical, or is historical, because Norbert Wiener was writing about cybernetics in 1948. That's when he defined the term. And so you find artists calling themselves cybernetics artists in the 1960s, 1950s. And it's kind of gone out of currency yeah. a little bit. But I decided that I would, uh, I would adopt it as, as the best explanation for what interests me um, and those systems that I, I like playing with. Mm. I noticed the feedback um, plays a big role in, in all of your art installations. Uh, and you talk about emergence. Do you want to kind of um, go into emergence for us? Uh, I talk about emergence and, and uh, there are two ways of thinking about emergence. Uh, first of all, an emergent uh, characteristic is something which is just surprising or novel. Uh, it, it's where you're a, a, a little bit shocked yeah. by uh, what something does. But it actually, actually has a very sort of technical um, ascription. Um, emergence uh, is a characteristic of some systems uh, which um, are complex and chaotic. They have uh, a lot of uh, very sensitive dependence on initial conditions. They are not random, they're actually deterministic. Mm. But when you have enough freedoms within a system that it can traverse all sorts of different behaviors within a broad phase space using a lot of lingo here, you can sometimes have the potential for these uh, strange and surprising, uh, what I call emergent behaviors. But not random. Not random, no. They're actually predetermined by the states uh, and the parameters that are available to the system. Cool. Um, I, I got a little story about an emergent behavior, which is one of the first ones uh, that I noticed. I made uh, an installation to take to the National Gallery of Australia back in 2001. I was working collaboratively with another artist called Richie Kuhout, and I was also working with um, a third party uh, programmer, uh, a guy called uh, Phil uh, Dench, and he wrote uh, a, um, 
a machine vision system for an interactive uh, installation that we exhibited in a gallery uh, at the National Gallery in, in Canberra. And it had an animated version of me based on a, a body scan of me. Okay, and, and this animated version had all these predetermined behaviors uh, and it was behaving more or less the way I expected it to and interacting with its audience. And I walked away from it and I looked behind my neck and I noticed that this, this three-dimensional animated Jeffrey was pirouetting. It was doing a spin <laughs> around and around and around like this. And I called Phil and I said, you put an Easter egg in my artwork. <laughs> I thought he'd embedded a little surprise behavior for me just to sort of delight me. But no, he said, I, I swear, Jeffrey, I did not put an Easter egg in that code. And then we discussed it a little bit. And the, the artwork had some uh, behaviors. It had a, a shyness factor built into it, which I discussed with him. So it tended to turn away from the audience. Mm. Okay. And what that meant is that after a long period of being exhibited, it would get wound up because it would me measure its angular deflection from zero and it can go past more than one <laughs> rotation. So after you know, a few hours of being exhibited, it's at several thousand degrees of rotation and it has to unwind, which it does by pirouetting. <laughs> Uh, which it, it backs up against its own viscosity constant and it's only allowed to spin at a certain speed. And so I saw this thing happening. I thought, wow, this artwork's behaving completely deterministically, completely according to the rules that were given to it, but creating something new and unexpected. I thought, wow, oh, how do we explain that? And I think the best language to explain it is the language of emergence. Mm. So it's not a bug, it's a feature. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Wow, that's really cool. Um, I think I have to reference this now because it's uh, suddenly gotten more active. I swear it's actually more active. Yeah. Little counter, yeah. yeah. You're, you're part of the loop though, so yeah. it's yeah, right. uh, it, what's more active, you or it? Good point. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's emergence, right? <laughs> well, it depends on what we what you get up to between the two of you. We, we, we could see some emergence. And I, I actually think the uh, larger version of this has my, it's not my favorite piece that you've done, but it's my favorite response to it with the audience. <laughs> Walking yeah. through it it's off in a loop. It's, it's off camera at the moment, so no one can see, but there is a huge counter there that's making that, that clicking noise. <laughs> Mysteriously counting up. Yeah. yeah. You say huge counter, it's actually called little counter, because it's, <laughs> it's, it's a miniaturized version of, of a much bigger one that I made uh, that, that Alex is talking about. The, the, the big version of counter has uh, nine digits. Yeah. Well, the little one here just has one. Uh, and, but the interaction that you're talking about uh, is what I call a pedestrian barrel roll, <laughs> where, where a sort of yeah. cycle of people continuously trigger the artwork. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I also do regard that as a form of emergence. But we're having uh, emergence come not just from a, a software system or from a mechanical system, but from a system uh, composed of human beings and an artwork. So the, the scope kind of grows and, and expands, and then the opportunities for emergence uh, uh, expand uh, along with them, I guess. That big one, uh, I think it's, its um, fixed limit was just under a billion? Right? It can go to one less than a billion, than a billion and then yeah. it will clock over. And did any of them get there? <laughs> it's, it's never gone that high in an installation. I zero it each time it goes to a new environment. So it starts okay. from naught and goes from there. Uh, and so far it's counted around about a million events so far. Uh, so... Yeah, we've got a fair bit to go to get to a billion. <laughs> uh, I would like to take it to somewhere with more people, you know, yeah. like uh, maybe 10M in square would be good and see if we can manage a billion, but uh, that's for the future. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, Central Park. Yeah. 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 Good yeah. idea. Even then, a billion would be hard. Maybe we should count something smaller, you know, like ants or. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what. Out of all your installations, which one's your favorite? Whoa! That's a, yeah, jump, jump straight to... Oh, that's unfair. <laughs> uh, of, of, 
it's always the one that I'm working on now. Of mm. course. Okay. And the one that I'm working on now isn't even finished yet. So it's still an idea. Uh, it was the one that I showed you the prototype of downstairs. And that will eventually, when it's all finished, if, if it comes to fruition the way I hope, it'll be called the moment of decision. And it's about the, the act of making a decision. And that's a, an animatronic piece with, with sensors and movement and kinetics and robotics and pneumatics. Uh, but it's not, not finished yet. So we'll see so how that your, one goes. Your current yeah, favourite so. then? Uh, so yeah, yes, it, it is my current fa favourite. But uh, there are other favourites, I guess. There's a crowd favourite, which yeah. is a work I made called Floribots, which are the sort of uh, robotic <laughs> pot plants. Yeah. with the origami blooms uh that's been voted sort of crowd favorite a couple of times i have to agree there i i think that's right up there and it's the kind of thing i actually just want to purchase <laughs> <laughs> just put it in your bedroom yeah. somehow it's yeah like or, gigantic or in thing. the office lobby you know yeah. it's, very it's cool. a it's a very cool um piece of art slash robotics where do you um, get the inspiration for your artwork? Because um, I think there's some mention of mythology in uh -huh. what you do. So do you actually delve into you know, the old school myths to inform your art? Uh, I do talk about myths uh, for some of my pieces, and, and it's an important idea for me. Uh, in, in terms of Floribots, that's not explicitly the implementation of a mythical yeah. story. It's a combination of, of choosing something which is accessible. Uh, at the top of each um, uh, Floribot, the, there's an origami element, which is a chatterbox, uh, yeah. which oh, is yeah. just something that everyone knows because we all know how to fold a little origami chatterbox and it was a point of connection. But I use uh, mythology similarly as a point of connection. I regard uh, myths, you know, kind of um, broadly, more than just uh, Greek mythology, but any kind of common story that we all know, yeah. even if it's a, a, something from popular culture, uh, a movie like, let's say, Blade Runner, that a lot yeah. of people might have watched and you can make references to, uh, and it becomes so embedded in a culture that it's like a myth or another story that everyone knows is the story of uh, Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. And of course, you do have the classic Greek myths. Yeah. So uh, I regard these myths as being like um, published uh, interfaces to human psychology. They're, they're open APIs. Okay. They're they're they're, <laughs> they're ready to go specifications where if you press certain buttons, certain things will will happen. Certain uh, concepts will be brought to light and activated. So by you know, sort of drawing in a, a mythical element to a composition, you can, you know, get some form of ready engagement. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a shorthand, as I said, it's like a, an open API mm. to, to... Into culture. Into culture, wow. if you like. That's an interesting, that's a really interesting way of seeing it, where um, across all of humanity, there's a common thread of stories in our past. Yeah. But I don't know about all of humanity because there are lot, lots of different mythologies and, yeah. uh, you know, there, there's, there's Norse mythology, there's Aboriginal dream time, uh, there's yeah. a whole, whole spectrum, there are Jewish mythology, uh, it, it goes and goes and goes, but certainly they, uh, they tend to uh, be universal in some way. They deal with fundamental uh, human needs, fundamental human uh, emotions, fundamental human situations. So they tend to play out in a way that we can all understand uh, because of their, their universality. Um, and th they have an, an embedded logic which we can usually access. Yeah. Before we continue this podcast, here's a message from our sponsor. Vision is our art form. Emotions are the narrative. And we believe boundaries are just stepping stones. Film my video. Telling your story. It's interesting you mentioned Blade Runner because I watched your TEDx talk uh, where you talk about your inspiration, I think, for the ballerina. And um, you, mentioned, you mentioned Blade Runner. 
which I, I, I thought was interesting. So you went into the mythology of robots and um, artificial humans. Um, do, you want to, do you want to tell us a bit about the ballerina and the, the I guess, the, the entire journey? Because yeah. it started as quite a simple concept, right? And now the, the I wouldn't say end product, but the way you took it to was quite far away from the original idea. It, it's getting more elaborate uh, in the... <laughs> In the TED talk, I speak about created beings, which are any type of kind of person-like artifact that somebody makes. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are lots of mythical uh, precedents for that. You know, in, you have the story of the original story of the, the Pygmalion, for example. But Blade Runner has a, a really nice instance of a special case, which is uh, Rachel, who mm -hmm. is a replicant but she thinks that she's real. Yeah. Okay, so this is like a, a an edge case, a limit condition, uh, where you uh, are to all intents and purposes the same as a real person, but definitionally, you are actually a robot. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I collect these cases, and, and there are other cases as well, which are similarly you know, well known, like of course, um, when Victor Frankenstein makes the creature, yes. uh, which doesn't e it doesn't even get a name, you know, th this creature, which ends up being very jealous of uh, his creator, and there's a source of a, a lot of problems there. This type of um, manufactured being is a common trope in a lot of uh, popular cu culture. You know, that the Skynet from the Terminator movies. It's the bad robot, the bad AI. <laughs> The one that uh, is the the nemesis of humanity. Anyway, I, I collect all of these themes, and, and they inform various uh, stabs at uh, creating beings in the form of artworks that then interact with an audience, uh, and sometimes produce these novel behaviours, these uh, emergent conditions, uh, and sometimes just explore their their phase space, their, their freedoms. Uh, and sometimes just elicit responses from an audience. The work that we talked about before, the, uh, the Floribots artwork, some people think that that's very friendly and fun and happy. Other people think it's very scary <laughs> and uh, gruesome and negative. Uh, and these are great responses to elicit from an audience. It shows that people are, are, are thinking about what they're seeing and extrapolating from a, you know, just a, a little art installation as to, you know, what is my attitude to this, this made being? Uh, is this like me or is this different from me? Does this have the same rights that I do or is it in a different category? I, I do remember um, little girls bullying people with chatterboxes. So maybe they had some uh, <laughs> negative experiences <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> with yeah, a chatterbox. Yeah. Yeah, deep seated memories. Yeah, well, yeah. I, Ultimately, it's not the tool, is it? It's what you do with it, yeah. It's interesting though, because there's the, there's the feedback you were talking about. So this kind of artwork actually pulls pulls reactions from people. And um, I think the fact that you it's cybernetic art, it means that there's more going on. It actually responds to the audience as well. It actually creates a lot of interest from the audience. Uh, Floribots is uh, certainly pertinent to, to that discussion. It's got Mm. Uh, eight sensors. One problem I sometimes had with Floribots is people would walk into the gallery and they'd be really interested in Floribots. And I had situations where groups of, of young people would come in and they'd sit down cross-legged in front of it to watch <laughs> it. But of course, that makes them uh, cease to exist as far as the artwork is concerned because yeah, it only senses movement. So they would sort of blink out of its uh, perceptual sphere but by not moving enough. And I'd go around and say, it can't see you. <laughs> so if you want it to interact, you've, you, you've, you've got to offer something. Mm. And I guess it's that, that offering and exchange and what we can let the feedback loop kind of create with layer upon layer of uh, each, each uh, cycle adding something to the loop, which interests me, the extrapolation. Uh, rather than any one iteration, let's see how far we can go, how many times we can loop through it. It's brilliant. I, I, I think they are my favourite, just the... Flurry bots? Yeah, yeah. I can't tell you why though. You know, I, just honestly, I just, yeah, they, they have a, a feeling to them. And it, it's, to me, it was a friendly feeling. You know, they, uh -huh. they're like, they remind <laughs> me of a sci-fi movie I can't actually pinpoint, but 
you know the the characters walking around and the environment is reacting to them um much like minority report but friendlier <laughs> yeah somebody's yeah. told me uh that they're like triffids this year oh, remember, triffids. Uh, yes john Wyndham's uh the novel hunter. Uh, but they're dangerous yeah you gotta be careful about <laughs> yeah. triffids one thing about Florobots when it's actually installed and running in a gallery in an environment is that each um, each little origami makes a noise when it opens and closes. It goes, it snaps, okay. um, and it's a very quiet little noise. You know, it's just a little A4 sheet of paper just opening and closing. You can uh, you barely hear it, but there are 128 of them, <laughs> and every now and again you get a sweeping succession of these opening and closing noises, and it's like a cacophony. This is interesting. This this is. This audio aspect of the work is emergent so far as I'm concerned, because yes. I'm not a, a sound artist per se. I don't make the compositions in sound, but I'm interested to see what comes out in the end when, when, the, when the work is triggered uh, by its environment. Well, actually, let's, let's talk about your origin story. So you, you actually have, <laughs> you have a uh, computer science degree from 1985, if you don't mind me saying. Which, Way back then, yeah, yes. Yeah, which is... Uh, impressive much much different to a different what it, world yeah. to today's technology yeah. Yeah. so how was it different and has it has it really informed about informed you about how you create things today yeah. I was talking to you guys before we went on camera about when I first started studying computer science at UWA they still had card readers yeah. in the basement <laughs> of the uh, computer science building and these were not just uh, museum pieces I used them for my assessments <laughs> uh, I actually produced stacks of punch cards, which got you know put in the hopper and read by the card reader. Incredible. Um, I'm glad we've progressed since then. <laughs> yeah. But the the subject I studied was computer science. It was like an abstract discipline of computation. Mm. Um, so there was quite a lot of treatment about uh, computability, about uh, algorithmic uh, correctness proofs. Uh, there was uh, a fair bit of treatment uh, about the conceptual basis of, of computation um, and not much treatment about practical software engineering, mm. uh, about methodologies, about producing commercial outcomes. Um, but I did actually go into commercial application development. So I had a, a lot of learning to do after my uh, degree, which was in a, as a sort of an abstract discipline to learn the practical discipline afterwards, which I did do. I learned about methodologies and uh, building software for commercial outcomes. But I did enjoy the way I studied uh, in that, uh, that scientific mode. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess I ran another kind of uh, activity uh, alongside uh, my work as an IT guy. I was secretly, if you like, uh, uh, creating, uh, <laughs> creating artworks for exhibitions. So I start, ha started having um, my, uh, art exhibitions uh, my first year after graduating I in saw computer that, science. 1996, you had yes. your first exhibition. Yeah. Um, so you were always an artist. Yeah, but I didn't sort of know very much. I was just paddling around <laughs> and trying my best. But a, a few years later, I went to art school, uh, which at first I had resisted. I thought, no, I don't want to go to art school because like all young people, I already knew everything. Uh, <laughs> and then I realized I was ignorant and that there are things to learn. And I went to art school and that changed my life. Right. Uh, and certainly changed my art practice. That's interesting. And it was only after art school that I really brought computation together with, with art. Uh, and it's that crossover between the two, which I've been exploring pretty much ever since. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, then you became a cybernetic artist. Indeed. Yes. Yeah. There was, there was a process to that. So I've been a full-time professional artist for about the last, I'm not sure, maybe 10, 12 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, but up until then, I've certainly had a day job. Like most artists, uh, it's very difficult to make a living out of art, so you, you, need, you need another gig. So what was your breakout piece? What was the, um, that, that, uh, yeah, that breakout moment where you suddenly could quit the day job? <laughs> well, what's been important for me is access to public art commissions. 
So uh, I still have gallery exhibitions. And sometimes my gallery exhibitions are in commercial galleries. Sometimes they're in public galleries. But I don't make any money out of that. Uh, the only way that I've found for me to make any money out of art is via uh, public art commissions. Mm -hmm. And there's something that's a little bit spooky about that world. In order to qualify to do your first public art commission, you need to, and this is compulsory, you need to have already done a public art commission. <laughs> so it's a perfect gotcha. Uh, there's no actual way into this loop. Um, so you have to sort of uh, break the rules somehow. Uh, and in, in, in my case, I got a public art commission with another artist I was working with, a guy called Richie Kuhart, to do a, a laser installation uh, on a building in Canberra. Mm -hmm. And Richie and I had been playing around with lasers and we were lighting all these different things with these lasers and taking photographs of it. And we, we sent in a... Whoops. Oh. <laughs> Artworks waking up over there. Uh, we sent in a proposal and we got shortlisted and I flew over for an interview and the selection committee, they were looking at some of the images that we'd made and they said, well, one thing that we feel really greatly reassured by is the fact that you have so much experience. <laughs> and they were looking at photographs of, um, you know, the DNA tower in Kings Park, okay, the double helix tower, oh, yeah, okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, one night in the dead of night, Richie and I went to Kings Park. I held the, the laser spars out like this and he took some photographs, okay. Uh, and then we put that as documentation about the sort of things that we did. And so uh, this was being interpreted as being a permanently installed artwork uh, and, and proof of our ability to make such things. I didn't, um, I didn't correct her view, right. no. <laughs> so uh, on the basis of, of this kind of stunt, if you like, that we performed one night in Kings Park, we got a, a, a real gig to yeah. do a proper permanent laser installation in Canberra. And from that point on, we were in the loop because yes. we'd, we'd done our first public art commission and it was therefore possible to get another one. But you have to, you know, make that impossible jump to begin with. Is that why we see a lot of uh, guerrilla artists just doing you know, um, pop-up installations that are totally not commissioned or approved by anyone? You know, they, they hope for that viral moment because I guess they could still use that as evidence of doing a public it might, might be one of the uh, motivations. Yeah. Maybe they're just doing it because it's cool or they've got <laughs> something to say. But if, if it's another way to, to uh, jump through that impossible membrane, then uh, good luck to them, yes. Uh, one piece of advice I sometimes give artists is to uh, act as an assistant for somebody else. Yes. And then you get uh, something on your CV which is referenceable. There are other ways through it, but it is difficult to get your first gig. Definitely. Have you done any guerrilla art installations uh, that you can admit? <laughs> <laughs> uh, once or twice, it's kind of felt like it, you know, installing a counter uh, and, and taking it out and, you know, being accosted by the police. What are you doing putting that here? But I have actually, I must admit, rather boringly had permission. <laughs> so, no, not full, full guerrilla, not as yet, yeah. Before we continue this podcast, here's a message from our sponsor. We believe that you can create art and beauty with technology. We think big. We move quietly. We are Ninja Software. One of the questions I did want to ask is, is there any, and you don't have to answer this, but is there any failed failed projects where your, uh, maybe your aspirations were outside the realm of possibility or, or physics got in the way? I, I think the idea uh, behind that question is really, really interesting and it continues to fascinate me that generally things are, are buildable, yes. uh, that it is possible to make very elaborate constructs and I don't think you know, it's kind of philosophically that I, I'm owed this by the universe. <laughs> Why is it possible uh, to to bring together a collection of atoms that behaves in this particular way according to a vision that you had at the beginning? Mm -hmm. And I keep being surprised that the universe permits this. Um, 
uh, I have a particular circumstance, uh, you know, uh, that happened a while ago with an artwork I was, I was making. I was making a, an artwork that went uh, to Sculpture by the Sea at Cottesloe. Uh, it's called Solar Jane and uh, it has a, a pirouetting ballerina and she's on, on a base which is a, uh, a hexagonal pyramid base which is tiled in solar panels okay and i designed this in my mind before i started making it and so i worked out that in order to tile this this pyramidal hexagonal base i would need triangular solar panels and I wouldn't just need any triangle. I mean, I, equilateral wouldn't do. They had to be isosceles triangles. <laughs> and they had to have a ratio, aspect ratio of about 1 to 1.2. And they had to be about 30 centimetres wide. I've never seen a triangular solar panel. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> triangular solar panels obviously don't exist. Yeah, exactly. However, when I went to the internet and I looked for them, they were there. <laughs> so... Uh, to me, I felt a little bit like that's a sort of deja vu moment uh, as per the Matrix movie is when they change something, okay? <laughs> Were they there before I needed them <laughs> or did they just edit them in for convenience? So it makes me a bit suspicious about the whole script and how things are proceeding that things keep being possible. So either they get edited in or there's something about the nature of the universe which is positively predisposed to creativity, which is how I have decided to look at it. Mm. Things that we can dream of are often makeable, and more often than not. Uh, I know that you guys uh, make uh, all sorts of things with your work with the, uh, the Ride Fair project. Is something you can conceptualize, but there are a sequence of steps that will actually deliver that outcome. And That's it's right. extraordinary that these, these things are uh, available to us with mm. tools that we can, in fact, access. It's not impossible. It is and doable. You don't have to see the whole path. No. You, you see the end. You see the start, and that's enough. Yeah. <laughs> but those triangular solar panels are deeply spooky, and <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure about them. So do you believe the universe is a simulation? Oh, <laughs> the, the simulation to philosophy. hypothesis, as it's called. <laughs> uh, I've thought about it. I think that uh, there's no particular point in regarding it as such. And that my working assumption is that it's fully real. Because if it is a simulation, it kind of doesn't make much difference. Mm, yeah. uh, and the logic steps in the simulation hypothesis uh, have some steps which and uh, uh, not uh, unquestionable. Uh, so I, I don't think it, it's a completely sound and valid argument that says most likely we're in a simulation. I think maybe, yeah. but what difference does it make anyway? And Very I'm, I'm proceeding on the basis that we're in base reality. Yes. Yeah, uh, and, and we can build simulations from here if we like. <laughs> <laughs> what about... Uh, uh multiverse where because you desired the isosceles um, <laughs> or, or in another world yeah. you're still the it guy yeah it's it's split off and, and they were there yeah, yeah that's true. <laughs> your um request to the universe was granted with a fork of the of the timeline <laughs> sure i mean there, there is that philosophical uh um problem where you ask why is the universe such that intelligent life can exist well duh because you've just asked the question. <laughs> so uh, th perhaps, uh, in fact, all possible universes exist in some sense, but all of them just collapse because there's no observer uh, in order to, uh, that's able to ask that question. So we self-select to be the universe like that, that gets instantiated and we get to ask these silly questions of ourselves yeah. because all the other universes just pop out of existence for lack of those questions uh, the um no one was able to hear the tree fall so <laughs> <laughs> um now for a really boring question that i'm sure you're asked all the time uh, what's your creative process I, oh. I have to i have to ask you i know you're probably sick of hearing that question yeah i think anyone with any kind of creativity is probably sick of hearing that question but i have to ask especially being in your awesome studio which um is full of creativity i this is a really cool space. 
I get asked variants of that question from time to time, you know, how do you create, uh, et cetera, et cetera. My, my core answer is that I allocate time mm. because uh, if you want to think creatively about something, uh, it, it's, it's hard. And it's much easier to have a cup of coffee or to look at Facebook or oh. to do almost anything else. Yeah. Uh, and I'm an intensely lazy person. So <laughs> if you give me any other option, I'll take it. Yeah. So every now and again, I'll say half a day blocked out. You're not allowed to do anything else, Jeffrey, except think creatively within some parameters. Okay. I'll give myself some parameters that I really want to sort of dive into. But uh, I, I force everything else off the agenda. I don't take calls. I peel myself away from the computer screen because the computer screen is fabulous for research, you know, mm. to fill the bucket up with information. But it's kind of unstructured information until you make some synthesis of it. Uh, and for that, I need uh, screen off time. Yeah. So yeah. I'm, I'm really lucky you were talking about my studio, not only... Uh, do we have some interesting things inside the studio? But my location here, uh, I'm just right next door to an amazing place called Karakata Cemetery, mm. which is this huge, vast park. And that's where I go wandering. I actually physically uh, turn off my computer and I take my notebook, pen and paper, and I go for a walk in the cemetery and I let the cogs turn uh, in that time that I've allocated uh, it's a beautiful place and it's full of human stories and, and pathos and history. So it sort of prompts some uh, connections which are not obvious when you're looking at, you know, the, the stuff that bursts out of your computer screen when you log oh. into the, you know, today's news on the internet. Yeah, it allows a bit of a disconnect. Uh, it, all, it gives yourself the capacity to loop out of the standard spiral somewhere else. That's brilliant. What about shower moments? <laughs> any, shower uh, thoughts. Yeah. Any, um, Eureka, sudden. any of your inventions from a, a, a sudden burst of creativity? I, I think like everyone else, yes, the, the, the shower is a great moment of, of synthesis. <laughs> um, what you have to do is you've got to load the problem in uh, and then let your subconscious do some cycles on it while you're... Uh, kind of a little bit relaxed, you know, you're in the shower, you're at perfect temperature equilibrium with the universe, the, the, the white noise uh, soundscape of the shower blocks out everything else. So you, you, you sort of uh, take off uh, your leash and your subconscious can run some extra cycles on the problem. And sometimes it, it, great answers pop out that way, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's where I do my creative thing. <laughs> 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 yeah always in the shower <laughs> well you yeah so don't install a screen in the shower would be my advice then <laughs> yeah no, no. not even a speaker it's, it's tempting listening to music, yeah i think the white noise of the shower uh, helps, is yeah. quite important because it sort of smothers out that that sensory input it's like a um uh, a sensory deprivation chamber in a way yeah mm. Mm. it's true well since you do a lot of like high-tech art um i'm curious about where you think humanity is going in terms of technology? Mm. It's a bigger question, but things like um, what excites you about the near future, or what scares you about um, what you know the technology that's coming, uh, and all that kind of stuff. What are your thoughts yeah. on all the all the uh, big ticket items? We've got AI, data. Um, there it goes. Mal <laughs> malfunctioning <laughs> or deterministically um, emergent tech yeah um stuff like that what, what do you think about it and um, what can we do what both excites me and concerns me and is certainly part of the future mm. uh is artificial intelligence and the way it will uh be used in our everyday lives mm. uh there is a theme uh which i am uh i think is relevant which is the theme of beneficial ai that is it is not necessarily a given that uh, any artificial intelligence or any uh, general artificial intelligence or any self-improving, self-reprogramming general artificial intelligence <laughs> that we might happen to make will always have goals which are aligned with the goals of humanity. And aligning those goals will make the AI beneficial to people. 
Uh, and as a, as a person, I'm concerned about that. So I think that, that we need to invest quite a lot of effort into uh, the sort of uh, the regime that we build around AI to align its goals with our own. And yeah. I think that there's work that needs to be done, uh, not just uh, technically, but philosophically. Um, People like me who read a lot of uh, science fiction when they're a kid remember the you know Asimov's uh, rules of robotics. Robotic. Yeah. Okay, the, uh, and, and they're a very uh, trite and simplistic set of rules, and there are all sorts of exceptions to them. And a lot of his stories are about loopholes in those laws, but they're yeah. not a completely bad idea. Uh, I remember when I was studying computer science back in the 80s, I used to read about AI research that was being performed at that time, where people were working on evolutionary algorithms. Yeah. So in order to generate an intelligent bot, you'd sort of breed up a whole batch of a thousand or so and uh, have some competition between them. Yeah. So the most intelligent one would tend to uh, reproduce and you introduce some uh, genetic variation and, and you just set up an environment like that and you'd run it um, in compressed time and see if you uh, generated something interesting. When I was reading these des the descriptions of these experiments at the time, uh, the experimenters would say that they performed uh, these environments, they built these environments under, uh, behind uh, air gap firewalls. Uh, in, case, in case it breaks out. Okay, and this is serious <laughs> researchers were saying this, and uh, people aren't talking uh, in those terms these days. So the, the AI development which is happening now is certainly not behind uh, an air gap firewall. Mm -hmm. For example, when I, you know, browse something on eBay or some other platform, uh, I, a, an algorithm tries to predict what I'll be interested in next. So it's trying to simulate my human uh, decision making process. And a lot of uh, efforts being put into improving that all the mm -hmm. time. OK, uh, so it's, it's trying to simulate a, a human decision making uh, process. And that's the opposite of being behind uh, an air gap firewall that is fully <laughs> enmeshed That's right, uh, yeah. with, with the connected reality that we all inhabit. So I'm not necessarily saying we need to go back to uh, air gaps, uh, which is you know, complete isolation for these sorts of experiments. I think the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, I don't know what the right analogy is, but the, 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 uh, the phenomenon is outside that cage already. Mm -hmm. But I do think we need to invest in making sure that we uh, have a planned trajectory for this thing, uh, that uh, we corral it in the sorts of directions which are most beneficial to humanity. Um, I know that uh, you guys are interested in, you know, the, the extrapolation of uh, technologies where we have greater abundance uh, yes. and uh, we can sub um, get beyond a lot of economic uh, limitations uh, yeah. of scarcity. Yeah. And I think AI has the potential to, to, to deliver on this. So it's a, there's a, almost a utopian kind of promise there, but we need to also invest in making sure that, it, uh, that we work the positive side uh, and guard against the negative side. Oh. So that, that's my expanded answer about what, what, yeah. what I think is all three of those things that you asked me, what, what's going to happen in the future? What am I scared of? Yeah. And what am I interested in? They're all the same thing. They're all yeah. various versions of, of this AI, this artificial general intelligence. So what about with your own um, art installations are you, or art projects? Are you starting to implement uh, AI into them or, or looking into that? Yeah. My, my uh, installations have software yeah. But I'm not a, a an AI uh, developer, mm -hmm. and I don't claim that my work is actually uh, a part of the, the science of artificial intelligence. I might use a couple of little uh, readily available libraries, like some uh, face recognition uh, mm -hmm. routines, which come from that domain. <coughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And are, are trained using uh, human annotated data sets we can't um, do it any other way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we don't know how it works. No, we don't. Just, just no idea. Just <laughs> uh, yeah. 
But that I kind of use that as a, as a black box, yeah. if you like, yeah. within a broader uh, st structure. So my job is no, not to be part of the AI development effort, but to make commentary about it. And I okay. make commentary that has enough ingredients uh, from the topic in, in terms of it. Yes, it does have hardware, it does have software, and it does interact, uh, and, and it does have a reasonably large state space. Um, but there are limitations to that. I, I'm not a, a university uh, computer science department sort of building the next big thing. Of course, no. yeah. Yeah, I'm observing I, that from outside. I only ask because um, this piece over here, ah. uh, it feels like it has a soul. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> it, you trigger it and it feels like it's breathing. Yeah. And, it, and it, from, from my um, ignorant you know, perception of it, it's doing something different every time, but it, feels like it has purpose to what it's doing uh it's it feels alive yeah it is a, a simulated self a little baby simulated self and some of my works are more elaborate in their simulation of self but in order to sort of uh capture the human audience you need to activate that sort of thing where people are thinking it's a bit like me it, it has moods yeah. uh and i must say for one particular artwork, which we've spoken about, Floribots, I explicitly programmed that in. When I wrote the, uh, the mind, as I regard it, of, of Floribots, I uh, gave it a range of emotional states. Uh, and they were modeled on uh, my, my own children. Uh, I have two boys and I was writing this software when they were quite young. Uh, and the youngest was actually still a toddler. Yeah. Uh, and toddlers only ha have a certain kind of phase space, if you like. They get grumpy, they get tired, <laughs> they get angry, hungry. they get hungry. Yeah. Uh, and, and they switch between these, uh, these modes. And I, I built this into the way Fl Floribots behaves with its audience. And I think people can kind of sense that. Mm. They think, oh, it's, it's in a bad mood with me. Or, <laughs> oh, did I deserve that reaction that I just got there? And you can trigger this, these kinds of associations. Uh, and so if it's, if it's working that way, I'm pleased. It's, it's operating. It, it's triggering those associations. Uh, I'm hoping that it can. It, yeah, so. Well, I, I, yeah, definitely. I definitely feel it. It's, it, it's uh, ineffable, but it's, it's there. <laughs> yeah. That's, it's quite a simple uh, piece, but it does maintain state. It's not just playing a loop. Mm. It's it's learning mm. in its own little way from each stimulus that it receives. The um, I'd say bigger brother of that, the one I think it's at UWA. Uh, I forget uh, what it's called. I think you're talking about a work called Headspace, yes, which Headspace. is a, a 256 rod uh, variable matrix. Yes. yes. Yeah. Bigger brother probably doesn't quite cut it. Uh, <laughs> well, how about that? Does that have uh, you know? the same kind of state machine as as its tiny little cousin over yeah, here. it's 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 uh it's derived from a different uh code base mm -hmm. but there's a lot more complexity in that yeah. uh, it's one of the biggest uh state spaces that i've ever dealt with in terms of a uh a kinetic active interactive sculpture because there are 256 of these kind of rods mm. but they all have um uh, quite a big addressable range. I can't, I can't remember. I think there's about 128 bits yeah, uh, of, of resolution uh, on, on each one. And if we multiply that out, that, that, that's a big phase space. Uh, however, that particular piece um, activates another form of human engagement, uh, which is anthropomorphism. That work actually uh, has embedded in it uh, face scan data of 600 school students from Christchurch Grammar School. So it can make little kind of three-dimensional wow, uh, rod matrix portraits of mm. 600 different individuals, and it can morph between them and go into chaotic states. Um, so w within its uh, knowledge base, it, it has uh, some information about human physiognomy, if you like. Mm. Here we go. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Just had to chime in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Does the um, does the installation also um, re react to the audience? The one that I'm talking about Headspace. called Headspace. Yeah, yeah. Yes, it has 
four uh, uh, motion detectors. So pretty much everything which has a computational basis that you'll see in my art practice reacts to its audience somehow. Mm. It doesn't just play a loop, it generates a behavior based on input and based on state which it maintains internally. There's only one exception, uh, which is the work that you might be familiar with, uh, which it's called Read Write, and it's on the side of the next DC building yeah. in Malaga. That particular work is not activated by human uh, inputs. It has four cosmic ray detectors. So it Brilliant. detects incoming uh, events from outside the solar system. Depending on uh, what physics you read, some of those events that it's reacting to have origins from outside uh, the galaxy. So, and perhaps millions of light years uh, involved in the causal chain that leads to the cosmic ray, which is detected by the, uh, the sensor and causes uh, a, a motion sequence on that artwork. So that's the one exception, but all the rest of them respond to human uh, activity in one way or another. No one is notable um, you know, in, our, in our professional lives. We've been to Next DC quite a lot. Um, and we always we always commented on it. Yeah. Wow. That's, what's that's what's fantastic. The what's the pattern? But what's yeah, the... actually, that was one of the questions we kind of asked ourselves: Why is it moving in that way? And we finally and found you out. Think about it: um, hundreds of thousands of people drive past it every day, and none of them are realizing that it's actually communicating this uh, silent song to them. They just think it's moving on a timer or something like that. It's, it's not moving on a timer, uh, and there is one aspect of that particular artwork which is interesting, I think, conceptually. It, it acts as a quantum lens. That is, it takes a quantum level event, which is uh, detected by the uh, Geiger-style sensors. Basically, the, the cosmic ray detectors are two Geiger counters wired to a coincidence detector, and a cosmic ray will activate both of them to all intents and purposes at the same time. Uh, and then you uh, detect and interrupt. But what that means is uh, you have a, a quantum level event, yeah, a muon particle, which is uh, has the same charge as an electron, but is 200 times more massive, has actually hit both Geiger counters simultaneously. And then what happens on the side of the building is you get a propagating wave sequence made out of uh, 32 uh, one meter uh, diagonal panels that are rotating because that particular muon hit that detector at that time. It's always been a kind of philosophical question whether quantum uh, scale events have any relevance to the macro world. Mm. So if you can imagine you're driving to work one day, you look up and you look at my sculpture because a muon hit that corner at that moment, which is a quantum scale event. And because of that delay, you miss the traffic lights. <laughs> so you're five minutes late to work. So you, uh, as a result of that, you uh, meet the person that you end up uh, marrying and have children with, or, 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 or some <laughs> causal chain uh, like this. Uh, and that changes the world, potentially. Oh, it, it, it could uh, be a, a butterfly effect generator uh, from a, a quantum event to a macroscopic event. And so it is in theory possible, I know, because I've, I've made one. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's a really good point. Your actual art installations... It's affecting people. Yeah, they, yeah. they interact with people and essentially change the, you know, uh, change the outcome for them, the, the uh, as small as it determination. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Everything and everyone affects every, everything and everyone. So, you know, your project, uh, uh, um, the, uh, the, the ride fare project will, will, will change lives. So that's not unusual. I guess what might be unusual is to set an agent free and let it um, uh, navigate its own path in life. And that's why I call these things created beings. And that's why I try to give them enough freedom so their behavior once off the leash is sufficiently interesting mm. 
mm. that I can watch it from outside and see what emerges and, uh, and, and see what the possibilities are. And it is that interaction is far more visible. I think with, with let's say a traditional art gallery, uh, you kind of a lot sometimes look at each piece and the majority of them you give little thought to and you walk past. And then the ones that actually you could say um, have an impact on you, it's because of you know, they're, they're so thought provoking or beautiful. And, but no one would really be able to tell just standing on the side watching it because you're probably just like this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but a, a movement or an interaction that's unexpected elicits a far more visible response, which must bring you a lot of joy actually, seeing that um, it happen. In, in real time. Yeah, you're right. I can't read thoughts. So uh, the, the <laughs> in, internal journey of, of somebody pondering an artwork is not easily accessible to me. But if I can see people running around in a loop, I go, yes, bingo, <laughs> it's, right. it's happening. Something, <laughs> something's being activated here. I can, I can experience it and measure it from outside. Did you expect that? The, uh, the people vector. <laughs> uh, the, the pedestrian loops? Yeah. No, that, that was extraordinary. Uh, and it, it's, it seems to be an attractor uh, in, in chaos theory terms because this same behavior keeps generating uh, with different pools uh, of uh, audience unrelated to each other. So when the, that particular artwork went to Denmark and Europe, I, I saw the same behavior occurring that I saw in Sydney, that I saw in Cottesloe. Yeah. So there's something uh, about human beings when offered this particular interactive experience that <laughs> tends to spiral off in the same direction every time. I think people like leaving their mark on something and this every, every time you trigger it, you've left your mark. You know, you've, you've actually left something with it. Yeah. Well, in the case of counter, which is the artwork we're talking about, it enumerates. Mm -hmm. That's what it does. It assigns you your unique <laughs> number. Uh, and sometimes people ask me about, well, what do you mean by that? And I, I offer them two interpretations from which they can pick and choose. I can say, well, um, you know, it's a great thing to be counted, uh, to, to stand up and be counted is to participate in the social order. It's, it's like voting at an election. It's like making your life count. It's like contributing. These are the positive aspects of being counted. And then I contrast them with the the scary ones about being surveilled by a machine and reduced to being just a number in a database. Mm. And so I offer people the choice. Do you want to be counted or not be counted? Most people like being counted, but a few people I've known have made the decision, no, you won't count me. <laughs> and fair enough too, yes. That would be my father. He prefers to live off the grid. Yes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> behind the air gap firewall. Yeah, well, I remember a friend of his signed him up to Facebook and um, I was living in Melbourne at the time and I get this phone call a day later saying, get me the hell off Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which is both, it, it, it's, you get your name on there, but to Facebook, you're just that number in the database that they're trying to sell things to, essentially. Sell adverts, push adverts. Yes, I think we have to uh, be cognizant for all um, online services that we use. What, what is their optimization? Uh, what master are they serving? Mm -hmm. uh, and how are they making money? I would like to see a, a, a declaration on every website saying how that website makes money. Do they make money through uh, selling your information to third parties or do they make money by uh, harvesting your eyeballs and pointing it <laughs> at, at, uh, at advertising or are they a user pay subscription model? Uh, and I think that should be explicit. And mm. I think that uh, it's okay if you go into <coughs> these interactions and your antennae are up and mm. you're thinking, well, okay, what's, what's this service optimized for? How can I use it to my advantage? But I think a lot of people, uh, perhaps a lot of young people in particular, might dive into that service thinking, oh, it exists for my uh, uh, use and betterment and pleasure without actually finding out how it's optimized uh, and, and being sure that they agree with that. The example I usually give is the uh, the dating uh, application. So let's mm. say you, you want to use a computer online dating application and you might think 
that it could be optimized for you to find your perfect mate. But no, if you find your perfect mate, then you are no longer available for the application. You no yeah. longer have any value. Uh, you've been exited from the domain that it's able to harvest value from. Oh. So maybe it's not optimized to find your perfect mate. Just consider this uh, when oh. you're using these services to find out how they optimize, how they make money, what they're for, what master they serve. And that, that jumps back to your using AI for good, uh, where they're most likely looking at your trends and patterns and every, um, every one month relationship you enter, they're like, that's the one we, you know, the, the, the key metrics, we, we package that up and sell it to you again. Uh, yes, and there are, it, it gets spooky if you look at the behaviors of the, of the uh, predictive algorithms underneath some of these services. Uh, they will try to uh, re-engage you uh, down the track in order to harvest more value from your interactions uh -huh. uh, based on whatever their uh, business model is. Uh, and I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, uh, having a business model. Uh, you know, we all have to eat. Uh, but I just think that a generation ago, people were aware of the business models that they were engaging with. They knew that if they bought a newspaper, then the, the, the purchase price of the newspaper went in part to pay the journalists and the, and the advertising that was placed in the newspaper had a function in the economics of it. Well, sometimes the economics of the services we use here are quite opaque from a consumer point of view. And I think some more exposure of that would be beneficial. And I think that there's uh, some education that needs to be done. I think digital citizenship needs to be um, taught. And I think it already is taught at schools, but perhaps a little bit more emphasis could be mm -hmm. placed on it so people figure out how they're actually uh, interacting with these services, which they seem like they're free. They're not free. <laughs> Some, there's no such thing as a free lunch still today. Even with the internet, that Sorry. truism hasn't changed. Yes. Uh, before we started recording, we talked about the COVID safe app uh, that the government has released and um, everyone's up in arms about the privacy violation. Um, you express some pretty, yeah, uh, illuminating thoughts on. Um, when I first heard about the, um, the COVID safe application, my, uh, I, I was suspicious and anxious because I, I'm uh, quite careful about my digital privacy. Mm -hmm. I don't have uh, Facebook installed on my smartphone uh, because uh, of privacy concerns. However, uh, I do have some other applications installed on my smartphone. So I went through a process where I, I looked honestly at, at what I do to protect my privacy online and how much uh, uh, inconvenience I'm prepared to wear. For example, I'm aware that if I buy everything with cash, folding paper money, then my transactions are not going to be traceable. Mm. But I don't do that. I buy most things with credit card just because it's easier and more convenient. And I leave behind a digital trail which, uh, from which information could be harvested. Uh, and do I trust that that will never be harvested? No, I don't. I, it's outside my control. So I certainly know that I make compromises about my, uh, my digital privacy already. Mm. So, and I'm being asked to make yet another compromise uh, by installing COVID safe. However, the equation is different. Instead of it being a convenience technology, which I'm being asked to do for amusement, for some social uh, interaction or finding it a bit easier to pay for something, uh, the, the transaction is not just my safety against the virus, but community safety against the virus. And this I found quite compelling mm. because, uh, because of what's happening in the world and the way Australia has handled um, uh, coronavirus, which seems to be exceptionally well. Um, I think I feel quite proud of being an Australian, uh, the way that the community has by and large, pretty much done the right thing. So I wanted to continue to participate in that. So I made the decision to sacrifice a little bit of my digital privacy and download this application because I thought ultimately 
I would be hypocritical if I didn't. I'm prepared to sacrifice digital privacy for these other conveniences, or well, this is uh, a rationale which is, is of a higher order. Mm. It's community safety, not just convenience. Therefore, the decision criteria took me down that path. And I, I do hope that people consider uh, that logic. Um, I know that the, the privacy on it is not perfect and the effectiveness on it is not perfect, but it is a contribution. Um, and I think the trade-off is worthwhile, yeah. Is uh, the, the COVID-19 situation, has that inspired any new potential projects after the one you're currently working on? I have an, a sort of an idea for an idea at the moment, uh, and I call it a bubble. Uh, and in my mind, it's about two things. One is, is the bubble of relative kind of virus safety that Australia seems to exist in, in an international context. I think that Australia uh, had the great benefit of having an early example set by uh, Jacinda Arden of New Zealand. Uh, but to the credit of Scott Morrison, everything that she did, he pretty much did the next day. So <laughs> it, I, I was happy with that. Um, and it's worked out seemingly very, very well. So we're kind of in a bubble and this, this metaphor of a bubble, bubble is of interest to me and I'm cooking up something in my mind. But a bit like the story I told you with Counter, there's more than one version or, or, or more than one interpretive frame you can put on this concept of a bubble. Mm. Uh, and they're not all just nice and comfortable. The other kind of bubble which I find spooky and disconcerting is the idea of a, a social media uh, bubble where due to the algorithms which are optimized uh, for commercial purposes, you will tend to be fed uh, news and information which confirms what you already believe yeah. mm. because that's what you're most likely to click on which will further engagement and produce uh, uh, profitable harvestable outcomes for the algorithm which is optimized for, for this purpose so we can exist in an online bubble where we only see what we already uh, believe what we want to know and some of those bubbles could be pretty spooky you know dominated mm. by conspiracy uh, theories for example I, i'm concerned about these uh, i think that there's there's uh, a phenomena that, that that's that's real and ultimately it is a freedom that people have to decide what information to consume but they may not be conscious of how those algorithms mm. are optimized and what choices they're kind of making without knowing because of the optimization of the algorithms. I think that's a little bit unpublished and outside the control uh, and, and further exposure should be done of the algorithms. And, and uh, I remember a conversation I had some time uh, ago um, with my, uh, one of my sons who was turning 18 and he was confronted with the necessity of voting at an election. And I said, make sure you obtain uh, that you turn off all the filters uh, of the information that you receive, because uh, normally he would only read news about space launches and games. Those were his interests. But that's not sufficient to decide who to vote for at a federal election. You need to broaden your, your funnel a little bit uh, and take in some views that you don't even necessarily agree with in order to form a well-founded opinion. As I said, people have the freedom to consume whatever information they like. I'm not against that. It's just the, the hidden nature of the algorithm optimization that I'm concerned about. We need to unpeel this a little bit, be a bit more conscious of it and make some choices about how we deal with it. And that also goes back to what you're talking about, like data ownership. And um, I think you said the, your internet password, your digital, sorry, your digital passport, your digital passport and what these companies are doing with your data. Uh, it's hard to feel, it's hard not to feel like social media is kind of tearing us apart and going against its original purpose of actually increasing people networking and, and interacting. Sometimes it feels that way, but mm. I, 
I'm old enough to uh, remember the, the amount of uh, mindless uh, television that I watched when, when I was a boy and how people made predictions about uh, how that would numb everyone's brains. And we kind of tolerated this technology and it was the shared experience of our time. Uh, television's kind of more or less history now, but the shared experience of our time is something else. I think the humanity will kind of deal with whatever it is and adapt and we will get savvy and and consume this in this new uh, world uh, in, in a discerning way. This is my hope. Um, I think we need to, to push for that, for that discernment, for exposure of these motives and so on. Uh, so I'm hopeful uh, and I think that we've seen a lot of end of the world technologies before, none of which have actually resulted in the end of the world so we've prevailed <laughs> and, and our yeah. humanity has has remained constant somehow i do also think that uh for every movement there's there's a counter movement so yes a lot of people will hold the head down one particular track and maybe it will mesmerize uh, uh for a period uh but there'll be another time as well and there'll be a, a time when people um perhaps seek the inverse of a, cu a current fashion um, so in the fullness of time, I think we'll we'll find our way through. I'm optimistic. I'm yes, optimistic. I like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you have to be optimistic to build art that interacts with people. <laughs> 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 I, th I think it's inherent in in your work. Yeah. Uh, I, I think there's a certain uh, certain um, brightness about a lot of my work. It's mm. it's visually bright and it's active and it's uh, playful. Uh, but I think the, you know, the dark side also needs to be considered uh, just as we are in our conversation, not, not to be unaware of, of dark sides. Uh, but as I said, I, I am overall optimistic. I don't think that the situation is hopeless. I think it's, uh, it's, it's actually fascinating. Uh, um, we live in extraordinary times and mm. the potential for great good is manifold. Um, I think it's up to us. I think it comes down to personal choices and responsibilities of every decision that we make. Uh, we are we're complicit in this machine. Uh -huh. uh, we're, we're actually driving it uh, effectively, Sorry. collectively. So we should head it in the direction that we want it to go. Often people will encounter your art installations just like we did at Next DC and not really think about it as art. We, we, I mean, we, we knew it was art, but we didn't think of it in the same way you would think of a, a traditional art piece or, or a static piece of art. It, it did engage us and we actually talked about it. I think if, if it just sat there and looked pretty, it wouldn't have even entered our awareness. Yes. Uh, so the, there must be a lot of people who have a technical background who have also encountered your artwork and they potentially, because it's, you know, it's, it's an installation, it's there and they thought that's, that's a piece of art, not realizing that its creator has uh, a technical background and engineering spirit. Hmm. To those watching okay. who have <laughs> now gone, I want to be a cybernetic artist. Yes. <laughs> How do they start? What's your advice for them? Whoa. Uh. <laughs> In, in my case, uh, as I said earlier, I did actually go to art school Yes. because um, I thought that I had something to learn from that experience. Uh, and, you know, in every discipline, you stand on the shoulders of those that come before you. And this is true for art, just as it is for anything else. Uh, are there other ways uh, forward? Absolutely. Uh, but art using technology is not just about getting in your soldering iron out and making something quick smart. Mm. It's about actually tools down, don't make anything. Yeah. Think, well, what's worthwhile making? Uh, and, and that comes back to that, those, those core creative questions. Uh, and it's very difficult to advise you about what's worth making because that's going to be a different question for every individual uh, and those uh, strategies like allocating time uh, are, are, are germane 
once you can reduce it to a technical problem, then people with technical minds, and I, I enlist myself in that category, yeah. we know how to deal with technical problems. You break them down, you solve one bit at a time, you stack it all up and you eventually can solve it. But the hard problem is deciding, well, what's worthwhile? What should I make? What would be a contribution? What, what, uh, what would be uh, beautiful or interesting or something like this? Uh, and, and I can't even give you a proper strategy except beyond that one of allocating time. There is another possibility, which is to team with others. Yeah. There's a makerspace movement that works for a lot of tech people and it's full of brilliant engineering minds who can build anything. And a few artists and other individuals who you might regard as being more like dreamers. And the combination of the two works out quite nicely because the dreamers can describe something which they got no idea how to make. Yeah. And the text can say, actually, actually. I can do that. Yeah. And so you can have a marriage made in heaven that way. So uh, make a space, uh, and there are a few of them around, uh, one avenue for people to, to explore. And even if that's just a stage that you incubate some of your ideas or some of your processes, I guess it's a good place to start if you don't want to go back to university and start <laughs> <another theory. Ooh. laughs> Welcome to the end of another episode of Tech Society. On this day in tech, in 1998, Google files for incorporation, six years before holding their IPO. In 1956, at one ton and as large as two fridges, the first commercial hard drive was announced, storing a gargantuan five megabytes, an absolute unit. Thank you for listening, everyone. I'm Alex. I'm John. See you later. Bye. <laughs>